Okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through blood vessels in lab. So I'm just gonna skip over these two slides and we'll cover them in lab. So what we do is as we move away from the heart, then pressure drops. So what we see is. Uh, a change in blood vessels. So let me do. Uh, let me do. Let me. I do have to cover this part of it. So. So what we have in arteries, because arteries are under pressure, is we have to have an increase in connective tissue that allows the artery to expand and reflow. So the connective tissue is a band of elastic fibers that we call the internal and external elastic lamina. And so in the picture there are the two white bands here and here. Those allow arteries to expand and recoil under pressure. And then as we move away from uh, the heart, the amount of the thickness of the smooth muscle is going to change. Alright, so as we move away from the heart, on the arterial side, the smooth muscle decreases in thickness, and we have these elastic lamina that we don't have in veins. Right? Because of that, what we can do is we can categorize arteries as being conductive arteries. The conductive arteries have thick elastic lamina so that they can tolerate the pressure exerted by the ventricle so they can expand and recoil. So you remember when we were doing the, the heart dissection, the aorta was easy to pick out because it had a real thick vessel wall. It was rare and you squish it and recoil back. Right? So the aorta, the brachiocephalic, the common carotids going up the neck, the subclaneums going out into your sh shoulders, the, the common iliacs, which are the subdivisions, and the pelvis are all elastic arteries. They're, they're, they're designed to have recoil capabilities. As we move further away from the heart and the arms, the brachial and the legs, the popliteal, uh, what happens is the muscles get thicker and what we can do is we can vasoconstrict and dilate those blood vessels more. So we call those muscular arteries because they, they help control blood flow patterns to the, to the extremities. All right. So when we get to where we exchange material, we exchange material in capillary beds. And so a capillary bed is made up of simple squamous epithelium and its, its basement membrane. The small arteries that eat the capillary beds are called arterials. So we saw that in the kidney where we had the afferent uh, arterial and the efferent arterial. And they still have smooth muscle fibers although not a band of smooth muscle like we saw uh, in, in the muscular arteries. And so they can still vasodilate and constrict. And then what happens is the branches off of an arterial that lead directly to a capillary vein are called meta-arterials. And on the meta-arterial side of the capillary vein, we have what we call precapillary sphincters, which are bands of smooth muscle. So that if you want to increase blood flow into the capillary, we relax these sphincters, and that allows blood to flow into this capillary network. If we want to decrease blood flow into the capillary network, we constrict these precapillary sphincters. And that causes blood to flow through this main channel through the capillary vent, which is called a thoroughfare channel. So what we can do, and we see this uh, in the skin, where if somebody is hot, their skin becomes more pinkish. If they're cold, the skin becomes more pale. So when you're cold, you constrict these precapillary sphincters, and so instead of letting blood flow through all the capillary veins in your skin, you're quickly moving the blood from the arterial side to the vagal side through this thoroughfare. When you're warm, what you do is you relax those precapillary sphincters. That allows all the blood to flow out here, so you have more blood under the surface of your skin, it makes your skin look pink. <laughs> so the difference in those two skin colors is based upon the distribution of blood in capillary beds. 
So in sympathetic stimulation, we, like in embarrassment, we tend to dilate these precapillary sutures and allow blood to flow out there, which is why your, your face goes red. <laughs> and is because you've dilated those precapillary sphincters. So what we try to do, when we're going to talk about it, is, is we retain the amount of blood in our capillaries and our venules. And what we want to do is we want to control blood flow patterns in our body to maintain core circulation. So we want to be able to close off and or dilate capillary veins. So if you haven't eaten in three or four hours, five hours, then you're not going to be absorbing anything. So do you want all that blood flow to the capillaries in your intestines? No, you want to shut it off. If you're exercising and running, you want to dilate the blood flow to your muscles. But if you're sleeping, you want to decrease the blood flow to your muscles. So we have to have these three capillary sphincters that allow us to make that change. Uh, and so, again, if we constrict these sphincters, the blood flows primarily through the thoroughfare. If we dilate them, then the blood flows out in the capillary system to facilitate exchange. And so exchange in your body all occurs in these capillaries. So when we have talked about capillaries, uh, we had a unique type of capillary that we talked about in our kidney, in the glomerulus. And then we had a unique type of capillary that we talked about in our liver, the sinusoids. So what we do is we look at capillary beds and we look at how closely the uh, simple squamous cells are held together. Uh, and so in a continuous capillary bed, there are very, very small spaces between the simple squamous cells. So exchange actually depends upon moving through the cell primarily. In fenestrated capillaries like we saw in the kidney, we had bigger openings between the spaces, so the intercellular cleft was wider. It was not wide enough to allow blood cells to move, but allowed large proteins and medium proteins to move through the space. When we were in the liver, we were talking about sinusoids. The space between the uh, endothelial cells or squamous cells are big enough that blood cells can flow through them. So in bone marrow, you want to have a sinusoid so that when you make new red blood cells, they can enter the cardiovascular system. And in the liver, you want to be able to move aging red blood cells out of the blood so the liver can destroy it. So that's why sinusoids are found in unique places, um, such as in red bone marrow and the liver itself. So in essence, what we did is we talked about this one in the liver, we talked about this one when we did the kidney, and most of our capillary beds in our body are actually like this, that can be just with very, very thin openings. So the reason why we have smooth muscle and those precapillary sphincters is so that we can adjust blood flow patterns in our body. So about 8% of the blood flow is in the heart itself. So that involves all that coronary circulation that we talked about, left to the right coronary arteries, air branches. And this is blood flow patterns that feed the heart. So when you're sleeping, you need less blood flow to your heart because your heart's not working as hard. When you're exercising, you have to increase blood flow to the heart because your heart's working harder and your rate per minute uh, contraction's gone up. So we need to be able to adjust all of these uh, based upon the body's needs. So in pulmonary vessels, we usually have about 12% of our blood flow. That would include the pulmonary trunk leaving the, the right ventricle, the pulmonary arteries going out to the lungs, the capillary beds in the lungs, and then the pulmonary veins returning blood to the left ventricle. And so if we change that, we, and we change blood pressure uh, based upon changes of blood flow patterns. So one of the things that can happen during pregnancy, for example, is you can get pregnancy-induced pulmonary hypertension. And when you get pregnancy-induced pulmonary hypertension, what they're saying essentially is you've actually increased the blood flow in this network, which is increasing pressure in, in that network. Right? And it's a shift in hormones that causes it to happen. So typically we have about 15% of our blood in our major arteries, in 
and our arterioles being conducted away from the left ventricle, going out to our extremities and all of our organs. At any one point in time, we have about 5% in, in the capillaries themselves. So we have about 5% of our blood that are out in these capillary beds themselves. And then the rest is all in the thoroughfare and in the venules that are draining capillary beds. Is that because there are only Well, it, are you asking why the blood is here so much? Well, yeah, because you because in a capillary bed you primarily dissipate most of the pressure that's moving the blood, and so you got a, a real decrease in blood flow in the venule side. And we can use that as a blood reservoir, and we use our skin capillaries as our biggest blood reservoir that we can play games with and change pore circulation. So what happens in hypovolemic shock where somebody has got low blood volume is when you, when you do their pulse, then you're not going to feel much pulse out in the extremity. And their hands are going to be really cold and clammy because they started shutting blood flow out here down to keep core circulation down. So. All right. So what we depend upon in capillary beds is our ability to exchange things. So we're going to use diffusion where the entities are small and they can move through membranes fairly easily. So for example, in our lungs we talked about carbon dioxide and oxygen being uh, used to, to diffuse through it. In our capillary beds, as long as glucose is bound with insulin, and it'll pass through membranes and diffusion. We depend upon amino acids that we take in and, and absorb as nutrients to move into muscle and stuff through capillary beds by diffusion. And then most of the hormones that we're going to talk about in the next unit and the ones that we talked about in the unit so far are all being loaded into the blood at high concentrations. So they'll diffuse into tissues. So we're, we're using that as, as a diffusion. Right? So the other thing we can do is we can have cells, the endothelial cells that line the capillary beds, involved in the process in active transport. Right? So uh, we call that transcytosis. And it's called transcytosis because our reference point is the lumen. And so we, we, have, we have this, uh, we have this capillary band. And here's the lumen. And the cells that are lining it are these squamous cells. So the squamous cells can pick something off the lumen. They can transport it across their cytoplasm and then transport it through this membrane. So we're actually transporting it in this membrane, transporting it in this membrane. You get it out into the interstitial fluid where it can be picked up by tissues. So it's called transcytosis because it's traveling through the cell. From, from one membrane to the next membrane. So it's a classic uh, example of endocytosis on the lumen side and exocytosis on the other side of the membrane. And then the other thing that we can do is we can create a movement of fluid and substances with fluid will move in the direction of the fluid. So what we do in a capillary bed, uh, as we look at a capillary bed, going from the arterial side to the venule side of the capillary bed is because there's high pressure over here, there's a way to drive fluid through the endothelium. And so we're pushing fluid out into our tissues. And so if we can create a bulk flow, then anything that's being that's dissolved in the fluid will flow with the fluid so that we can create a movement of things in the fluid direction. In the other side of the capillary bed, what we're going to see is we actually reverse the fluid flow so that in the venial side of the capillary bed, we're creating a bulk flow inward. And on the arterial side of the capillary bed, we're creating a bulk flow outward. And those both help us exchange things. So for example, here we would want to move oxygen out into our tissues. Over here, we would want to move carbon dioxide into our blood. And so since initially it's dissolved 
at, in the fluid. And if we can create fluid flow, then we can actually help move things. So over here, if it was a muscle, we would want to move it. glucose using bulk flow. We want to use, move amino acids to allow us to, to make new proteins for ourselves. Over here, things like lactic acid and stuff we want to move in. So if we can create bulk flow, we can move things. We can move things in the direction that we want to do. So bulk flow is kind of a cool technique to help us exchange things at capillary bit. And what we can use is we can use pressure to actually create bulk flow. So here's the arterial side of the capillary bed. Here's the venial side of the capillary bed. And what we were just looking at here. And so the difference is that we have higher pressure over here, so we have higher BP over here. And what happens over here is we have lower blood pressure or lower BP. All right. So just in itself, we dissipate pressure in capillary beds. We'll explain why it, it deals with, as you enter a capillary bed, the number of small little blood vessels go way up, which is cross-sectional area. As cross-sectional area goes up, pressure drops. All right. So, so what happens is we end up with higher pressure here and here. So if we look at this scenario, then our blood pressure here, blood hydrostatic pressure is 35 over here. Now 35 is the force driving the fluid out of the blood. When you look here, the blood hydrostatic pressure is now 16. So we have actually lost half of our blood pressure. And so that's going to affect blood flow. So one of the things that was critical to understanding the way the kidney worked was B cup. So what was B cup? Blood colloid osmotic pressure. So remember, blood colloid osmotic pressure are the proteins, the plasma proteins that are in the blood. And the key is you don't want those plasma proteins to exit the blood here so that they're maintained. So what we're looking at then is an osmotic pushel because you have plasma proteins over solid. And so over here we're losing liquid. So the solvent is decreasing. So the relative amount of osmotic pressure is going to increase uh, relative to that. All right. So so what we typically do is we have to look at, at VCOP as a pressure. And if you remember the kidney, then VCOP was inside the glomerulus. And VCOP was a resistance to blood flow out of the glomerulus. Right? And it's the same thing here. So VCOP is a pressure that resists fluid exiting. And in all practical purposes, VCOP is maintained across the capillary bed. So since VCOP is maintained, over here we have a pressure of 35, and what's resisting it is VCOP, which is 26. Over here we have a pressure of 16, and what's resisting it is VCOP, which is 26. So over here, we have a positive number, which means blood, uh, fluid is going to vacate the part of the capillary. Over here, we have a negative number, which means that fluid is actually going to move into the capillary. So it, it, that's exactly the same as it was in the kidney. Now, the pressures that we have that we didn't have in the kidney are two new pressures, which is interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. So. So I have HP, and it's usually zero on both sides in normal physiology. So if you have somebody with a bacterial infection, uh, parasites, and other things, it would change with a normal physiology. Interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is zero. And one of the reasons is what we're going to talk about in the lab today is we have lymphatic vessels, and lymphatic vessels pick up interstitial fluid. So as long as we have vessels that pick up any extra fluid, we can maintain interstitial hydrostatic pressure at zero. So what we're going to see 
is if we have something that blocks a lymphatic vessel, then this will not be zero because then we can't move fluid uh, in our lymphatic vessels. Then our other pressure is interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is looking at the solutes over solvent of your interstitial fluid. Of, of your IF. So normally, in normal physiology, those solutes are fairly low and they don't change much. So the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is usually measured at one millimeter at, at both ends. What would change that would be bacterial infections and, and things like that, or tissue damage itself. Okay. So what it comes down to then is that what we do is we take the two things that the two arrows that are pointing outward, so we would have to add one, which is an arrow going out to 35. So we can do one plus 35 on this side of the equation. And then we look at the two arrows pointing inward, which would be VCOP at 26, and then interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which is normally zero, at, with this side of the equation. So what you end up with then is a positive pressure of 36, a negative pressure of 26. And so we end up with a positive pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. And this is the pressure that drives the fluid out of the capillary and creates bulk flow, of course. Right? Now, if we look at the Mendel side, in all practical purposes, uh, Interstitial fluid osmotic pressure doesn't change if you if you got somebody who's healthy. So 16 plus one. And again, interstitial fluid uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure if you have somebody who's healthy is zero. So now we end up with 17 minus 26. So we're going to end up with a negative number, which is negative nine millimeters. And this negative nine is the pressure that's driving the fluid back in to the cardiovascular system. So in an ideal world, we want 10 on both sides, then we can get even exchange. So the fact that we have a pressure of 10 here and a pressure of nine here actually tells us that we retain, uh, that we actually retain interstitial fluid. So the dilemma with retained interstitial fluid is it leads to edema or swelling. So that's why we have a lymphatic system to pick up this extra interstitial fluid. So as long as somebody's lymphatic system is working well, picking up the extracellular fluids, then we don't get edema. So as people age, this vascular pattern ages with it. So what, what can happen as you age is when you're young, you can go run and your fingers don't swell and your, and your feet don't swell. But as you get older, you go run and your fingers swell and your feet swell because you actually retain interstitial fluid and it takes a while to pick it up. In a little bit after, you know, an hour or so after you went and exercised, then the swelling goes away. So it's kind of an interesting process. All right. So what happens is if we retain interstitial fluid, we end up with edema, which is swelling in tissues. So what we do know that if we increase blood hydrostatic pressure, so if blood hydrostatic pressure isn't 35, what if it went up to 45? All these other pressures stay pretty much the same, then we would actually increase bulk flow, right? If we increase bulk flow, we're going to re-increase the retention of fluids. So what we typically see is people in high blood pressure oftentimes have more problems with swelling in their extremities and edema. So what kind of things increase blood and stand pressure? So this is cardiac output. So how did we measure cardiac output last time? So cardiac output was stroke volume times heart rate. So we could eat, we could increase cardiac output if we only Elevate heart rate, why? We can increase cardiac output if we increase stroke volume, or we can increase cardiac output by increasing stroke volume and heart rate, right? Now, how do we calculate stroke volume? 
and diastolic volume on this, and systolic volume. And is it diastolic volume during isovolumetric contraction or isovolumetric relaxation? During isovolumetric contraction. So the end systolic volume has to be during isovolumetric relaxation. So the other thing that can uh, alter is an increase in permeability of capillary beds. So something's altering the fluid flow in capillary beds so that we, we aren't recovering the fluid as well. So if we get an increase in interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, then that would be a, a factor here that would decrease the return of fluids in the visual side. One of the biggest reasons clinically why we've seen an, an increase in interstitial fluid osmotic pressure are bacterial infections. It's one of the reasons why if you have an infection, the, where the area where the infection occurs begins to swell. Yeah, it's because you actually alter interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. Because bacteria produce waste products. Those waste products add to your solute, solute load. Is that why it gets red too? Yeah. And in tissue damage, why does your foot swell when you sprain your ankle? Well, remember at one point, we have to worry about our plasma. We have to worry about solutes over solvent in our plasma. What's between the plasma and our cells? is interstitial fluid. So we always have to think about solutes over solvent in our interstitial fluid. And in inside our cells, we have solutes that are over solvent. And if water is moving all the same, we're isotonic, meaning that all these concentrations are the same. And in the ideal world, we want to maintain that isotonic event. But what happens if I rupture this cell? then all these solutes become part of the interstitial fluids, which then drives this solute level up, which moves fluid out of your blood into your tissues and leads to edema. <laughs> so the reason why when you sprain an ankle or, or do an injury that you get swelling is because you've just torn up a bunch of cells. And what used to be inside the cell is now no longer inside your cells. <laughs> and it's outside your cells, leading to that leading to a shift in osmotic pressure. Okay, so the other way we can look at it is things that would not drive fluid exiting the blood over here, but would decrease reabsorption <coughs> or, or bring fluids back in over here. So one that we would see clinically would be a decrease in VCOP. The most common reason for decrease in VCOP is liver disease, which is why if your liver doesn't work, you can't survive, right? And then we would see it in burns. Why in burns? Because you're weeping all those plasma proteins all the time. You're constantly losing them. And then we would see it in kidney disease where you actually have a breakdown of the filter and you're losing large and medium proteins in your urine. So we'd have somebody, when you did a urine analysis, would have a real prostate for urine, for proteins in their urine. And all of those would decrease VCOP. Well, remember, VCOP is our driver over here to bring the fluid in. It was 26 over here, and it was 26 over here. So if we drop VCOP to 15, and then blood pressure 16, then we would actually reabsorb no fluid. We would retain all the fluid in our tissue. All right. And then the other is lymphatic blockage. So, so we're going to talk about it in the lecture, but when you look at lymph, lymphatic system, so if you were looking at someone's leg going up to their growing, then what we do is we pick up fluid in these lymph vessels and bring it back. And then in our growing, we have little lymph nodes. And because we can get cuts down here where bacteria, viruses, and parasites can enter our tissues, then we pass the lymph fluid through these lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes are designed to trap and destroy uh, foreign invaders. And sometimes what happens is the lymph nodes get blocked, 
But if a lymph node gets blocked, then no blood, no fluid flow can go through it. And then you would be, even though you were picking it up, you would begin to retain fluids and lead to edema. So we see it in, in parasitic events, and then we see it in cancer, uh, cancer events where, where what happens is you have a tumor, and as the tumor grows, it sheds cells. The cells get picked up by the lymph flow, and then the cells get uh, caught in the lymph node. In normal physiology, the T cells would destroy the cancer cells, and then we'd all be happy. But if it doesn't, then the new cell, it got, uh, they got trapped but not destroyed, and undergoes mitosis and builds a new tumor. And then the tumor blocks the, the lymph vessel, and then you get edema uh, in that area. So, uh, so here's an example. You can see the same thing in can cancer patients. But here's an example of a little parasitic worm uh, that enters the blood. And if you look at this on, a, on the computer, what's really kind of cool is all of these things have red bands in them. As they are, the eosinophils, the eosinophil respond to parasites, parasitic worms. So it's really cool under, because this, this doesn't protect, because all of these that look like this are, are eosinophils loaded with red granules, right? So what happens is this worm actually, uh, you can get it in Africa and Southeast Asia. And what it does is it blocks lymph vessels. And as these worms block lymph vessels, then you end up with edema. Uh, and so the disease is called elephantitis because of the swelling that it produces. So it typically occurs in your extremities <coughs> first. So this is, these are two individuals with this parasite. And this is severe edema of the ankle and severe edema of this ankle where the skin is actually cracking. So one of the quick clinical tests for edema is if somebody is swollen uh, and you stick your finger in, normally it bounces right back like that. But if somebody with bad edema, you stick your finger in, and that little indention that your finger made will stay there for a while and slowly comes back. So that's a, a quick test for, for bad edema clinically. Stick your finger on the tissue and that's what happens. So this is elephantitis. Uh, leading to significant swelling of the ankle. Now what happens is it eventually blocks lymph nodes in the growing area. So this is elephantitis of a person more advanced with, with a swollen uh, scrotum, uh, where the scrotum is really swollen. And you see this, you can see this in cancer patients. That the most common one would be a patient who's in the end stages of prostate cancer. Usually what happens is if you don't catch the prostate cancer quickly, it, the cells get out of the prostate and invade lymph nodes in the iliac region of the groin and block those lymph nodes. And then they're the ones that would usually drain the scrotum, so the scrotum will get larger and larger and larger as they do it. So one thing you have to manage is you have to drain the fluid off the tissues. The other common one is metastatic cancers that get into the abdomen. Now cause somebody's abdomen to be in the swell, swell, swell. Uh, and you can remove several liters a day of fluid from the abdomen all the time to, to decrease the swelling by putting in a tube, a drain tube to drain it. Right. So and then eventually it can get into the arms where there's, uh, you get a deep in the arm on this side. Are they able to do this stage? Pardon? Are they able to hear? This stage, there would be significant tissue damage. The testes probably have, have been significantly damaged. So what you can do is you can reduce the swelling, but sometimes the skin has been so stretched that it, it, it can't recover without surgery. Uh, and this person's testes probably not functioning even after that. So the, the dilemma we have always with, with healthcare is catching a disease early enough so that, that you can cure it more quickly without the, the chronic long-term side effects. So when you get into remote areas of, of the world where healthcare doesn't exist, then you get these really extreme cases uh, before health before healthcare actually, if they survive. 
So these are all remote areas of uh, uh, Southeast Asia, these two pictures. And then this is from a remote area of Africa. So these are swollen inguinal lymph nodes uh, because the parasite is in the lymph nodes. Uh, they both had they both had uh, swollen uh, scrotums in the past because the scrotum is almost down to the knees on this individual. So what happened is the swelling was there. They they reduced the swelling, but the skin you can't regenerate all that skin, and so you'd have to do surgery. It's like somebody who's who's gotten obese and they weigh 600 pounds and then they lose 400 pounds. They they can never recover that skin and reabsorb it. So you have to do surgery to to remove the excess skin. Uh, and then this person has lymph blockage to the penis. So this is a, a penis with severe edema. So figure's not always better. As we go into the reproductive So, so when we look at blood pressure, blood pressure is the way we kind of assess somebody's cardiac capacity and, and their cardiac health. All right. So what we do is we look at blood pressure from when the ventricle is contracting and forcing blood into the aorta. So we so we're increasing the pressure in the aorta. And then that pressure that pressure increase is past all of our major arteries. So when the ventricle is contracting, we say the ventricle is in systole. So during ventricular contraction, we end up with what we call a systolic pressure. Now, in the next part of the cardiac cycle, the ventricle begins to relax. So as the ventricle is relaxing, it's getting bigger. What eventually happens is, as the pressure drops in the ventricle, it shuts the semilunar valve. And so then we have retained pressure in the artery. And so that's our diastolic pressure because the ventricle is in diastole. So what we typically do is write a pressure uh, clinically with systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. And then we think of the average as 120 over 80 as, as the ideal pressure. Some people have pressure lower than that naturally. Some people have higher pressure than that naturally. And there's not any, you know, and it's normal. So we usually view about 140 as kind of the boundary uh, for somebody going from normal to hypertension and high blood pressure as a systolic pressure. Uh, so there are a number of factors that affect blood pressure. So obviously cardiac output is directly related to it. Uh, blood volume is directly related because if blood volume goes up, stroke volume goes up. Yeah, stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up, and blood pressure goes up. Uh, right. So viscosity of blood, so viscosity of the blood is how thick the blood is. So one of the things that we could look at would be uh, we could do the hematocrit we did the other day. And normally we would want 54 and below for males. And so if, if you have polycythemia and it goes up to 70, then now you have more formed elements and less fluid and the blood becomes more viscous. So somebody who's severely dehydrated, their blood becomes more viscous. And then the electrolyte load, the number of things could affect that. And then the other is resistance. And so when we're thinking about flow, then there's kind of a cool pattern to, to flow. And it occurs in the pipes going in your house with either gas or water in them. And it occurs in blood vessels. So so when you're looking at a blood vessel, because the blood is made up of plasma, and the major constituent of plasma is water, and what we know is water likes to create hydrogen bonds. So water is cohesive because it interacts with itself. 
It's adhesive because it will interact with the wall of the artery with hydrogen bond. So what we have is we have a drag where the blood is flowing against the artery wall, and we have accelerated flow toward the center. So resistance is greater next to the wall, resistance is less toward the center. So in the aorta, because most of the blood is flowing in the center of the lumen, there is a lot less resistance. Now when we get to a small arterial, most of the blood flow is next to the vessel wall, and therefore adhesion greatly increases and resistance greatly increases. So as you branch your arteries, resistance increases. Okay. And then the elasticity of artery walls. So, so if we look at a major artery like the brachial artery in your arm, or the radial artery here, the reason why we can fill a pulse is because when the ventricle is in systole, the, the artery wall is stretched. When the ventricle is in diastole, it recoils to a smaller diameter. And so what actually happens in your body, the reason why we can take a pulse is during ventricular systole, the artery wall is stretched. During ventricular diastole, the artery wall recoils back to its original size. So, so there would be less resistance when it's stretched, more resistance when it's recoils. So one of the things we're going to do in life and like lab today is actually do blood pressures. And so the way you do blood pressures, I'm going to talk about more detail in the lab, is you use a set of sounds that was figured out by a early cardiologist whose name was Karatikov. So they're called Karatikov sounds. And what you do is you put a pressure cuff on the brachial artery, and you shut the blood flow completely in the brachial artery down so that you have no blood flowing. And then you slowly release the pressure. And as you release the pressure so the blood can flow, then blood after this restriction creates turbulence in the blood. And you hear, you hear discrete sounds uh, that are made by the blood. So as long as there's resistance on the artery wall, these sounds exist. Once the pressure of the cuff is below diastolic blood pressure, there's no resistance. Blood flows freely and there's no sound. So we're going from no sound to no sound. And what you do is the first sound that you hear is the systolic blood pressure. And the last sound you hear is the diastolic blood pressure. So the first carotid, the first carotid sound is what we determine as systolic pressure, because that's where the pressure of the cuff now is slightly less than the pressure of the blood in the artery. And then the last carotid sound is diastolic. So then the key clinically is kind of, and what you have to do is on young people, you can probably go up to 160, 180, and catch that first sound. If you have an elderly person, you probably need to go to 200, 210. Because otherwise you could start in the middle of a carotid cuff sound. Oh, well, here's a sound. And not get the upper end of the blood pressure. And so, so you always have to make sure that the cuff pressure is greater than what you think the blood pressure is going to be. So the way it occurs then is you have silence because you've cut, you've shut blood flow off. Then you go through a series of sounds. And the first sound in systolic is going to sound more like a tapping sound. And then it becomes more of a swish, an elongated sound. And then it becomes kind of a crisp sound. And then more of a, of a subtle blowing sound, which would be the last one, which would be diastolic pressure. So I'll do it in lab. Uh, and you can go out and play with it. There's, there's a great uh, site for people who are going into clinical arena. And you want to listen to all the sounds the body makes using the stethoscope. So it's called thinklabsmedical.com, 
and they have a whole sound library where you can listen to gastric sounds and other sounds that, that you need to listen to clinically. So it's kind of cool. So we can bring that up. I'll bring it up and listen to what's on the line. Well, the longer the pressure is on, the more tingling the fingers become, and the bluer the fingers become. So when you're first learning to do blood pressures, and you practice on each other in a clinical setting, it's like, will you hurry up? Because it feels like your fingers going to sleep, and they become blue. That's why we don't do common karate pulse. <laughs> systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, we actually get pulsing blood flow in our major arteries. And as we move away from the heart, the difference in systolic and diastolic pressure is come closer and closer to the It's always like the movies where they catch someone's throat and blood and oozes out. They just cut a big vein. You wouldn't, it would take you a long time to die. So if they want to make it correct and they cut the carotid, the common carotid, when they cut the common carotid, blood would probably squirt 30 feet pulsing with it. And then shorten and shorten and shorten as you lost blood volume. And, uh, <laughs> so I remember that from my childhood when my grandfather would get a bunch of chickens at Easter and then in September he didn't want to keep them through the winter, so the family would get together and we'd have a chicken slaughtering party so everybody could take fish home to the refrigerator and he would put their feet in little looses and then cut their heads off. And you get squirt, 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 and then you start to cut them. So that's what we really do. So if we look at velocity, that's the speed at which blood is traveling, then velocity is inversely related to cross-sectional area. So a cross-sectional area is how many branches that we have. So we think about the aortic arch, we have the first branch off the aortic arch, which is the brachius valley. We have the second branch, which is the left common carotid. We have the third branch, which is the left subclavian. And then the brachius valley for three branches. And then we create a right common carotid and a right subclavian. So, we have the smallest cross-sectional area here in this little scenario, and we have the greatest cross-sectional area in all of these arteries. So as this artery goes up in branches more, cross-sectional area increases. So every branch creates an increase in cross-sectional area. Well, not surprisingly, when we were talking about those pre-capillary sphincters, that we had all kinds of branching occurring in a capillary vein. So we reach our highest cross-sectional area in our capillary vein. So we're going to reach our lowest velocity of blood flow at the end of a capillary vein. Which explains why venules represent our blood reserve. <laughs> because you have the lowest blood flow in that area right behind the capillary. So what happens then is veins come together to make bigger veins, and then bigger veins come together to make bigger veins. So that eventually at our heart, we end up with two big veins, a superior and inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava is formed by the brachiocephalics coming together. The inferior vena cava is formed by the common iliacs coming together. So where would we have greater cross-sectional area? In these veins than here. So as we move blood back toward our heart, cross-sectional area decreases. And as cross-sectional area decreases, velocity of blood flow increases. So what we have is a really cool pattern where closest to our heart, we have the greatest velocity on the arterial side. And as we go away from our heart toward our extremities, velocity drops. In capillary beds, we reach the low point in our velocity. And then we start decreasing cross-sectional area, 
and velocity begins to increase again. <coughs> so, if you look at the cross sectional area of the aorta, it's about 3 to 5 centimeters squared, and blood's flowing about 40 centimeters per second. If you look at the cross sectional area of the capillary beds, it's 4,500 to 6,000 centimeters squared, and velocity re reaches an ebb of about 0.1 centimeters per second. Then when we coalesce all those blood vessels back into two vena cavas, since we have two vena cavas, they're over twice the diameter of the aorta, so about 14 centimeters squared, and velocity goes back to 5 to 20 centimeters squared. So it's a real cool pattern that exists. <coughs> okay. So one of the reasons why we see what we just said is resistance. So, resistance is inversely proportional to the forward power of the radius, okay? So, if we want to put resistance into a mathematical expression, <coughs> then resistance R is equal to 1 over the radius to the forward power, okay? And then, just to make sure everybody understands what a radius is, And it's inversely related, so the radius is in the denominator. So then, when we're looking at a blood vessel, the radius is half the diameter of a blood vessel. So what we're essentially saying is that a large blood vessel would have much less resistance than a small blood vessel. Right? So, this resistance explains why, when we get to a cross-sectional area, we got all these dinky little blood vessels, we get this real decrease in blood velocity because resistance greatly increased. So then blood, blood viscosity impacts that as well. So resistance is directly proportional to blood viscosity. So in other words, as viscosity increases, resistance increases which is why we're always concerned about that. And so as you age, blood viscosity tends to go up. The one way we can decrease blood viscosity is by putting people on baby aspirins. So at the evening when you're asleep, if you've got an increase in blood viscosity, and you have an increase in resistance, and blood flow begins to slow down, which leads to thrombosis in the legs, and leads to clotting of coronary arteries, which is why heart attacks go up at, during evening hours when people go to sleep. So then you, you put them on a baby aspirin, you control viscosity and decrease the incidence of nighttime heart attacks. Yeah. It's, very, it's very effective, cheap uh, medicine. So, and then total vessel length, resistance is directly proportional to so then would resistance be greater in my index finger or my big toe? My big toe is over twice the distance from my heart as my index finger, which means the blood vessel has to be longer. So the blood vessel only is directly proportional to my uh, resistance is directly proportional to this. So you have the greatest resistance in your feet. Yes. Okay. And that's why we see edema more frequently in feet before we see it in hands. Alright. So when we're looking at blood pressure, uh, what we have is we have a systolic pressure, we have a diastolic pressure. Those differences are the greatest, the closest to the heart. As you move away from the heart, because resistance is increasing, we get a drop in pressure. So as we move into arterioles, we lose that pulsing blood flow pattern. So we end up with a flat pressure instead of a high and a low. So to kind of figure out what's going to happen here, we can use mean arterial pressure as an example, which is 
the difference between the high and the low uh, on that. So, so what we said was that blood pressure is directly related to cardiac output. As cardiac output increases, blood pressure increases. And stroke volume and heart rate are the things that then drive cardiac output. So if we wanted to calculate mean arterial blood pressure, then mean arterial blood pressure is diastolic blood pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. So the other way you can write that is if you want to find mean arterial blood pressure and you use diastolic pressure plus three over pulse pressure. And the only other thing you need to be able to calculate then is, is actually you have to know how to calculate pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is actually the difference between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. So systolic blood pressure minus diastolic. Right? So if you know somebody's blood pressure, let's say it's 125 over 80, then their pulse pressure would be the difference, which would be 45. So pulse pressure would be 45. And I just like easy math, because 45 is divisible by 3. <laughs> so then if we would calculate MAP pressure, if we know pulse pressure is 45, and diastolic blood pressure is 80 plus 45 over 3. And like I said, I like easy math, so that's 15 plus 80. So that mean arterial blood pressure is 85. Okay? So those are the two equations you have to remember to calculate mean arterial blood pressure. First, you have to calculate your pulse pressure, systolic minus diastolic. And then you have to remember that diastolic plus one third pulse pressure is the same as pulse pressure divided by three. And you can do mean arterial blood pressure. It tells you the exact middle of your systolic and diastolic, which gives you a good reference to what it's going to be when you get to where there's no blood, where there's no diastolic and systolic pressure. All right, so the other reason why, you, the other way in which you can use it is because stroke volume is hard to calculate. You have to be able to take an image of the heart to do cardiac output by stroke volume times heart rate. Heart rate clinically is easy, you take someone's pulse. The other way to do stroke volume is take images of the heart during isovolumetric contraction, isovolumetric relaxation, use a computer to calculate volume, and then you know that. But the other thing you can do is you can use mean arterial blood pressure. So you can also calculate cardiac output by knowing mean arterial blood pressure, and you divide that by resistance, R. And then that also allows you to calculate cardiac output. And then resistance can be looked up on the team. Uh, and a table. Clinical table. For resistance. So they have kind of a general idea of what the radius would be? Yeah, because if you know radius, the resistance is, is the fourth power in, in radius, strength. Right? Exactly. All right. So one of the dilemmas we have, is, if you look at this system, is that we get a, a significant drop in blood pressure through a capillary band. And then we get a continual drop in blood pressure as we move towards the mean cadence. So what we end up with is the arterial side of the cardiovascular system being under pressure, which is why the walls have the elastic lamina to tolerate that pressure. And then on the venial side of the cardiovascular system, you've got this admin pressure. And so 
what we need is a way to facilitate blood movement on the low pressure side of the cardiovascular system. So what we're going to use is we're going to use skeletal muscle and chest recoil and the pulmonary system to compress veins to help us move blood. So that's why you want a vein that will collapse. So you don't want veins to have internal and external elastic lamina as part of their wall so that they will collapse easy so that when you move muscle, then you're actually collapsing a vein uh, and helping return it as a pump. So we end up with what we call a respiratory pump, which is a stretch and recoil in the lungs, and then a skeletal muscle pump that we use to return blood to our heart uh, because we're on the low pressure side. So if we looked at your lower legs, uh, what would, what, and then what happens if you look at a, at, at a three-dimensional uh, diagram of the legs, uh, you've got some superficial veins just under the skin, and then you've got quite a few deep veins, and the deep veins always run between masses of muscle, uh, the muscles that we learned in, in 241. So it's not uncommon for veins to run between muscle groups. And when they do that, then we can create this skeletal muscle pump. So the other thing that's unique about veins and lymphatic vessels is they all have one-way valves. And so the valves are designed so that they'll open up under pressure and then close under negative pressure. So that what happens is when you compress your gas drops and plantar flex your foot, then you actually compress a vein. So the blood that was in this compressed area gets pushed through uh, this valve to move toward your heart, and the blood down here closes this valve so the blood can't be pushed the other direction. So we have a, a pump that now pumps blood toward our heart. When the muscle relaxes, we create a negative pressure in the vein because it's not being compressed anymore. That closes the proximal valve and opens the distal valve for blood to flow in. And then we refill that section of the vein. The next muscle contraction does the same thing again and again and again. So that's why what happens is uh, the more sedentary you are, the, the more your feet swell because you aren't using skeletal muscle pumps to return blood back to your heart. In fact, if you are were in the military and you stand at attention and you don't, and you stand there for a long time, your feet swell. You, it's actually your shoes feel like they're getting swollen. Yeah. My, feet, my shoes are tight because your feet are swollen because you're not using any muscles to pump blood back. And then when you're laying in bed, the same thing happens, which is why critically heavy people get swelling in their feet and stuff when they lay in bed too much. Because you're not using any skeletal muscle pumps. And then what happens is, as blood pools, it begins to want to clot. And then if you get clots in your lower legs, then you get thrombus. And then we're always concerned with the thrombus because if they come loose, and they can go to your brain or your heart or your lungs and create an embolus which ends up killing you. That's why postoperatively we're always got to watch people's vascular supply, particularly in their legs, because while they were under anesthetic, their heart rate was down, therefore their cardiac output was down, therefore their blood pressure was down. Now, they aren't moving any muscles, so, so their feet will swell as they're undergoing surgery. And what happens then is the blood begins to pool and it'll want to begin to clot. The older you are, the more problematic that becomes. So, if we kind of summarize all the pressures that, that affect blood pressure, then what our outcome is looking at mean arterial blood pressure. How do we calculate mean arterial blood pressure? We take diastolic pressure plus one third pulse pressure. And then calculate pulse pressure is uh, systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. Then we can calculate our mean arterial blood pressure. So there are kind of two things that are being impacted. Things that will affect cardiac output and things that will increase resistance. So if we increase resistance, we're going to increase blood pressure. And if we increase cardiac output, we will increase blood pressure. So to maintain blood pressure, what your body has to do is try to maintain a given level of cardiac output and maintain a given level of resistance. All right. So 
Resistance is impacted by blood viscosity. So from a clinical setting, one of the reasons we do a hematocrit again is to look at the hematoformed elements to plasma the blood. So if somebody who has polycythemia or an increased production of red blood cells would tend to have a higher hematocrit value. And because their hematocrit value is higher, then they have an increase in blood viscosity by itself would increase vascular resistance and would increase blood pressure. So one of the reasons we would be concerned about somebody with polycythemia, I mean, ideally you think, wow, I got a great increase in red blood cells, that's good. What's well, good for peritonstrum? <laughs> but it's not so good for vascular health. So I think the other thing we, we, that clinically occurs is an increase in body size as an obese. So, so if you weighed 120 when you were a teenager, and now as a 40-year-old you weigh 450 pounds, then you essentially tripled your size. And when you add adipose tissue, you add blood supply, blood vessels. So the key to increase in blood body size is an increase in vascular bleeding. So what actually happens is, as you become obese, uh, you get an increase in total vascular ring, which tends to increase vascular resistance, which increases mean arterial blood pressure. So one of the reasons why we see more, more blood pressure problems in elderly people than young people is because we get older and we tend to put on more weight. As we put on more weight, vascular ring increases, and blood pressure goes up. All right. So then, the other thing that could happen is we could, we could get vasoconstriction. So they get vasoconstriction uh, results in a decrease in vasal radius, which would increase vascular resistance, which would increase blood pressure. So lisinopril, which is an ACE inhibitor, works because it makes you, you urinate more, but it also makes you vasodilate. Is that peripheral vascular disease? Pardon? Is that basically peripheral vascular disease? Right. Yeah, so people with peripheral vascular disease can become chronic high blood pressure patients. Yes. All right, so those are the things we can see clinically. We can see an increase in, in blood viscosity. We can see an increase in body size, which increases vessel weight. And then we can see a change in the way we're managing our vasoconstriction and vasodilation. All right, so the other thing is what increases cardiac output. So what increases cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So things that would increase heart rate would be decreased in parasympathetic stimulation or inversely a increase in sympathetic stimulation. <coughs> We could get an increase in venous return of blood from the body, which would increase stroke volume. The reason why we would get an increase in venous return is because we do have vasoconstriction going on. Because we're active like in exercising where our respiratory pump is elevated. So somebody has hyperventilation would tend to lead toward an increase in cardiac output. Right? And an in increased skeletal muscle pump that we just talked about. And then an increase in blood volume. With the increased blood volume, you increase blood pressure. All right. And the other one would be an increase in sympathetic impulses from the adrenal gland of the bone. So if we increase cardiac output, we increase blood pressure. If we increase resistance, we increase blood pressure. And that's what happens as, as resistance moves. So if you look at things that would increase cardiac output in relationship to things that we can think about clinically, is we already talked about this increase in sympathetic nervous system activity. But in general population, uh, infants and senior citizens tend to have a higher heart rate, and then females tend to have a higher heart rate. And then body fitness, uh, uh, the more fit you are, the lower your heart rate. Okay. And all those things would help you manage blood pressure. So 
we would anticipate students having a higher blood pressure, senior citizens having higher blood pressure, and females having higher blood pressure, just because of, of, of that effect. All right, and the other thing are catecholamines, so that's epinephrine and norepinephrine, and thyroid hormones that we're going to talk about in the next unit. So what we do know is that if you're hyperthyroid, you tend to have less body mass because you're using up energy at fast rate, but your heart rate is accelerating. So people who are hyperthyroid and tend to have accelerating heart rates tend to move toward tachycardia. So people who are hypothyroid tend to have lower heart rates, and so they move toward bradycardia. So that's actually why we manage, why clinically we have to manage thyroid among a number of things is its effect on the heart itself in terms of unmanaged thyroid activity. Right. So then the other thing we talked about was preload and afterload that affects the body. So preload was what? Well, so we want to increase the stretch on the ventricles. So what the volume of blood in the ventricle during an isovolumetric contraction would be in diastolic or in systolic? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a, it's a measure of intellect. I, quite frankly, it's just a, a measure of understanding. So the ventricle is either in systole or spotting systole is in diastole. And it goes from diastole to systole, right? So when does the ventricle fill with blood? Systole. Systole. Is the ventricle in systole or systole. is the ventricle in diastole? So diastole is when the ventricle is relaxed. So the AV valves open here. So since the AV valves are open, we can fill the ventricle. And it rapidly fills it first. Then you enter diastasis second. Then you have atrial systole third. And this all fills the Ventricle. So now the AV valve closes. That puts me into isovolumetric contraction because I'm now in systole. And the volume of blood was there because it filled in diastole, so it's in diastolic volume of blood. So preload is essentially the end diastolic volume of blood, right? So if, if end diastolic volume goes up, preload goes up. If end diastolic volume drops, preload, what's to your benefit for cardiac output? Do you want preload to increase or decrease? So you essentially want to increase end diastolic volume. So what happens when you exercise in diastolic volume increases, which helps you increase cardiac output so you can meet your oxygen needs to your body during exercise. When you're resting in diastolic volume, it drops back to a lower level, which decreases cardiac output, which allows you to adjust your homeostasis to your less oxygen. Okay? So what was after the No. But <laughs> close. Is the pressure in the heart to move blood into the septum? All right. So, afterload is the pressure the heart has to exert to open your semi-nerve valves. Okay. So, here is where my, where my AV valve closed. And then here's where my semi-nerve valve opens. And during that 
period of time, I mean, I said, well, I'm going to contract. Well, remember that in the aorta, we have blood under pressure. And if I can exceed that pressure, I can open the valve and put more blood into the aorta. But if the pressure above the aorta is greater, then I can't open the valve. So the pressure of the blood in the aorta is my afterload. So remember that when we're looking at a blood vessel, the pressure when the valve is open would be systolic pressure. So therefore, the pressure when the valve is closed is diastolic pressure. So clinically, our best measurement of afterload is diastolic blood pressure. So why are we worried when diastolic blood pressure goes up? Because the heart can't pump as much blood because it spends more energy trying to open the valve, right? Okay. The contractibility of the heart is pretty much very similar to what increases heart rate. Thyroid hormones. All right. So if we think of pressure being due to blood volume. And as blood volume goes up, resistance goes up. Then how does how does vasoconstriction and vasodilation help us? And what hormones help us with those two events? So remember angiostensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor. That's why lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor because it inhibits the conversion of angiostensin 1 to angiostensin 2 in your lungs. And we can drop blood pressure because we vasodilate. So what happens is if you get an elevation of angiostensin 2, that causes vasoconstriction. Angiostensin 2 and ADH tend to cycle together. So ADH's old name was vasopressin, which told you it was a strong vasoconstrictor. And in epinephrine and norepinephrine are also visual constrictors. So these guys can all lead to an increase in vascular resistance because we've got an increase in vasoconstriction. So our hormones that counter those would be AMP, which is produced by the atria because the atrial wall is being overstretched. So if the atrial wall is being overstretched, one thing you can do is dilate all your blood vessels and decrease blood return to the heart and drop the blood flow to the heart. Epinephrine, because it has both alpha and beta channels, can do both. And then nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. Which is, by the way, why on the Viagra commercials they always tell you to check with your doctor to see if you actually are in good enough cardiovascular health to have sex. Because when it vasodilates, it's going to decrease cardiac output. And if you already have compromised cardiac output and you vasodilate, then you could pass out. So that's why. Okay, so then if we look at blood volume, what hormones increase blood volume? Aldosterone, which, which targets what cells? Principal cells, where are they found? In the kidney. In the kidney, a little more, a little more refined. <laughs> distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Right? And it, it increases blood volume by increasing the reabsorption of sodium, creating an osmotic pool to reabsorb water. Okay? And then ADH works with aldosterone, only it targets what cells? Principal cells, but it doesn't cause a reabsorption of sodium, it causes the insertion of water. Aquaporin 2, water channels, yes. And then AMP makes you, and then ADH makes you P more or P less? P less. P less. That makes you conserve water. AMP makes you P more, which causes you to decrease blood volume, right? So in a clinical setting, we're always concerned about shock events because shock events can lead to death. 
So if we kind of look at the shock events, you could be exposed to, in a clinical environment, you could have hypovolemic shock, which is directly related to what we were just talking about, blood volume. Uh, and it's, a, it's due to a decrease in blood volume due to hemorrhaging or other events that are occurring, like string dehydration, hyperthermia, a number of things. Then we can add cardiogenic shock, which is due to poor heart health, which is what somebody goes through with a heart attack and ischemic problems. We can have vascular shock, which is due to inappropriate vasodilation. Uh, for example, sitting too long in a hot tub, taking Viagra when you shouldn't be taking Viagra. Things that could lead you to vascular shock that lead you could lead to your death. And then you could have obstructive shock as well which is where you've got an obstruction of blood flow due to an embolus that has moved from one area to the other. So all of these are, are shock events that can impact the capacity to a normal cardiac function. All right. So clinically, how do you know if somebody's entering shock? Well, typically they're going to have a, a weak pulse, but a rapid pulse. So they're going to be in tachycardia or bradycardia. You're going to be in tachycardia, but you're going to have, to have trouble finding it. So if you tried to find it in the dorsipatus on the foot, you probably couldn't find it at all. If you tried to find it in the radial uh, pulse, you might be able to find it. If you can't find it in the radial pulse, where is the best chance of finding it? In the carotid. Why? It's as close as to the heart. And we just took care of all those resistant problems. Greatest resistance in the dorsipatus, radial, and then um, right. right. When you would be tough if you were holding your hand while you're trying to pick your point, you find the skin is cool, pale, and clammy. Why? Because they've got decreased blood flow to the skin, therefore the skin is cool. Um, and like I said, rapid, rapid resting pulse, so maybe in a state of tachycardia. We did a systolic, if we tried to do a blood pressure, their systolic pressure would probably be below 90. So pretty low for a systolic pressure. The patient may be thirsty or nauseous when you talk to them. And usually they're in a, they're having trouble uh, answering questions, which is always why you're supposed to ask them a name and the date, all those questions you can ask to see if they can come up with an answer. Because they're going to be in a state of confused mental state because the brain is ischemic. They're beginning to have a decreased blood flow to the brain. So ultimately, what you have to do is reverse the shock so that you can keep them alive. Right? So if they're in hypovolemic shock, as we've been talking about blood volume, then what happens is the body compensates. And you can go into hypovolemic shock, and the body can bring you out, and you can survive. But if your body's capacity to rectify the problem is gone, you go from stage one to stage two, which is decompensated or progressive hypovolemic shock. And at that point, you're not going to save yourself, and you need clinical intervention. You need medical in intervention to save you, or you're going to go ahead and die. And then the last stage is stage three, which is irreversible shock, which leads to death. So when you come up on a car accident, there's blood all over the ground, and you got somebody whose pulse is rapid, they're cold and clammy, then you know they're in hypovolemic shock. And that's where clinical intervention is going to save their life, which is, all, is what we learn in first aid and the calling an ambulance that will come and help. So in stage one, compensated shock, we're going to get an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So how did you know that from the symptoms? The signs that you were just doing. A pulse rate, respiratory rate. Is this because the patient's going to be in tachycardia and they're going to be hyperventilating? So you're going to so when they're in shock, you know that they've got this sympathetic response going because they're in tachycardia, they're hyperventilating already. So you know that the sympathetic nervous system is trying to help them out. Then you're going to activate the renin angiostensin pathway. So you get a decrease in GFR, which will decrease the filtrate over the macula densa, causes the juxtaplomerular cells to release 
granin, which converts a blood protein made by the liver, angiotensinogen, into angiotensin one, which goes where? The lungs, where ACE converts it to angiotensin two. Ah, and what are we gonna do? We're losing blood. So we gotta decide where we wanna keep our blood. So do we wanna keep core circulation to major organs, like our heart and our brain, or do we want to worry about our fingers and toes? You want to maintain core circulation, so you want an increase in angiotensin too because it's a vasoconstrictor. It's going to start shutting down the blood flow, which is, by the way, why their hands were cold and clammy. And you're going to need a release of ADH because it's a vasoconstrictor, but also GFR would be causing you to lose 125, 125 milliliters of, of blood per minute in kidney function. So are you going to want to, you going to, want to fill the bladder with that, or are you going to start reabsorbing more water to try to conserve water? So you'd want to, you'd want to increase water reabsorption. And the patients are being in clinical signs of hypoxia. When you ask them questions, they're going to have a state of mental confusion going on. As they progress into stage two, then none of these are going to help them anymore. The, the body's done everything it could to maintain homeostasis. And so they clinically have to try to maintain homeostasis. So at this point, you're going to get a depressed cardiac output. So mean arterial blood pressure could be as low as 60. So remember 128, 125 over 80, the example we did was 90. Um, so now you've got a significant drop in blood pressure going on. And, and what happens is over time, the capillary, precapillary sphincters are smooth muscle cells, and they require oxygen to continue to contract. So as ischemia occurs, muscle begins to start for oxygen. And as muscle starts for oxygen, it goes from making 38 ATP per glucose molecule to 2 ATP per glucose molecule, which then compromises the capacity of the muscle to maintain steady contractions. So what's eventually going to happen is the smooth muscle is going to fatigue, and so you're going to get depressed vasoconstriction, and eventually what you were doing to try to save yourself is not going to work anymore, and then you're going to move blood away from core circulation because you're going to get an increase in capillary permeability because the, the precapillary sphincters are fatiguing. What happens then is you get you have no skeletal muscle activity because the person's going comatose. Now blood is beginning to pool in all of their extremities, and you're going to lead to intervascular cotton or thrombosis, and you get cell death beginning to occur. And the patient's going to now convert from where they were hyperventilating to now in a state of hypoventilation, which is going to lead to respiratory acidosis. Now, I didn't put stage three. Pupils fixed and dilated. No discernible pulse, no discernible respiratory. So, so, this is just a reiteration of everything we just talked about on what we would be trying to do. So as the, oxygen, as the brain begins to starve for oxygen, cardiovascular center is going to try to increase heart rate. So that's why the patient's going to go toward tachycardia initially, is trying to increase cardiac output to feed the brain. All right. Then what we said was, we'll get a release of ADH from the posterior pituitary. Then it's going to help us vasoconstrict and conserve water in our kidneys. And then we're going to get the renin angiotensin pathway, which is also going to help us vasoconstrict and also help us conserve water in our kidneys. And our ultimate goal is to try to return blood pressure by returning blood volume. So what would we do clinically if we can't return blood volume? That's why we have IVs, normal saline IVs, to return blood volume quickly. So this was at the end of the lecture one, it's also at the end of lecture two, so I just what I was going to talk about at the end of lecture two.
let me do this really quick. So remember, we have a cardiovascular center, and we have sympathetic and parasympathetic intervention. Sympathetic does what to heart rate? Increases heart rate and tractability. It also has uh, basal motor nerves that do basal constriction. The parasympathetic nerve to the heart is the vagus nerve, nerve 12, and it does what to heart rate? It decreases heart rate. So the way we try to maintain homeostasis for heart rate is by either either stimulating our cardiac accelerator nerve, which is what happens when you exercise. Then when you're done exercising, you stimulate the vagus nerve, which brings it back. So how does your brain make decisions on that? Well, it uses, it uses information coming from the higher brain that's telling you there's a bunch of activity like skeletal muscle activity, uh, and then the limbic system, which is the emotional part of your brain. And then it also uses proprio receptors, stretch receptors, tendon bulge apparatus, and then blood pressure monitors, and then uh, chemo receptors that look at blood acidity. All of those feed into that to make to try to adjust your heart rate. So it's really kind of cool system. This is just a pattern of what we were just talking about. Relating it to the SA node and the AD node. So the vagus nerve goes to the SA node and the AD node. The color cardiac accelerator nerve goes to the SA node and the AD node. And they override the normal beat pattern of the SA node and the AD node to either accelerate or decelerate heart rate. 